This is the first in a new series about the possibilities of what we might be capable of as humans, individually and also collective as well, and especially given the opportunities and, and also the challenges that are presented to us in this moment in time and history. So as we emerge from this paradigm shift that none of us could have possibly imagined ever, how can humanity become radically healthier more resilient and also more conscious beings as well. Impossible Human speaks to, we're gonna to speak to incredible humans already doing the work and uh, in many different fields, academic, scientific, spiritual, um, and we dig into what is possible for, for humanity. In this, our first show, um, we're really glad to have Skeena Rathor, who many of you already know is the co-founder of Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, and Skeena is going to be in conversation with Cassandra Veaton, who is a clinical psychologist, a mind-body mind body medicine researcher, and an author who probably also needs little introduction as well. So to begin with, as the world emerges from this, what's been happening from lockdown, I'd like to ask you by, um, both to introduce yourselves and just briefly tell me about any of the big shifts that you've seen. Thank you for watching this. And yeah, I, I would like to describe myself as a co-leader um, rather than a co-founder, actually, if that's okay. Um, I, won't, I won't explain in this moment why, but it has something to do with creating uh, a movement of leader fullness and, and power fullness. Uh, because I think in, in all of our various ways that we are that. Uh, I specifically sit within the guardianship and visioning circle of Extinction Rebellion, uh, but like many rebels, we do a bit of this and a bit of that. Uh, we do what's needed, um, as well as knowing that we have a, an important, each of us has a really important gift to bring to the, to the movement and beyond. So I'm particularly excited about this um, conversation with Cassandra because I myself met Cassandra a few years ago at a conference called Beyond the Brain. And I was very excited to think that she may have um, more, a more of a formula, if there possibly could be, for raising or expanding consciousness and awakening um, a co a, the consciousness of, of love is, is the way I would uh, see and feel uh, this expedition that, that we're on. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for Cassandra being here to talk to us about how we hold not just a vision, but a, a, an intention and a, a clear, um, almost a method, but, but we know that any method needs emergence at its core. So um, a method with maybe emergence at its core for how we would essentially create more and more understanding of our interconnection and our interdependence. And the reason this feels so important is because forever and a day, we have been divided and separated and living in the scarcity mindset and heart set to say something about the, the role and the aspect of the visioning circle within Extinction Rebellion. This is a circle that we founded in December 2018 and has become a founding principle for Extinction Rebellion to be able to speak to a vision and inspire and listen and feel a vision for the future of life on earth and for humanity. It's really important work because, um, as many people would say, um, we, we do become what we, we dream of becoming and what we do become um, the vision that we hold. And there is, when we, in Extinction Rebellion, when we talk about not having hope because the science, the, tr the truth aspect of the science 
doesn't lead us towards hope, it leads us into grief. We also know that we, we have to strengthen our capacity, our ability to hold vision in the face of that grief. So the work of, of the visioning team and all the, all the visionaries within Extinction Rebellion in all circles, because we all have a vision for change, a shared vision for change, is so vital. It, it's completely crucial to the expedition that, that we find ourselves on. And this is one of the reasons that we wanted to invite Cassandra here today. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I really appreciate this work that you're doing, Carrie, and also really admire Skeena and Extinction Rebellion. I've had the pleasure of being able to work with a number of different organizations that are focused on shifting paradigm. Um, the longest of which was the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where I now serve as a senior fellow, but worked there for 18 years and the last six and a half as CEO and president. And for those of you who don't know about IONS, we call it Institute of Noetic Sciences. It was founded by Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth person to walk on the moon. And on his way back to Earth from his moonwalk, he had a window seat in the space capsule and as he was approaching the earth from space was overcome with a very profound epiphany about number one, the interconnectedness of all life, the preciousness of the planet. Um, he had a sense of bliss and, um, you know, felt like there was divinity shining through everything, a kind of uh, Bohm's implicate order or divine intelligence and um, that the universe was uh, alive and he was a part of it and really couldn't be separated from the molecules in his body, the stars, the sun, the moon, the space capsule. And then when he was viewing the earth from space also, he was filled with a deep sense of despair at the insanity that is present on the planet. And from space, it's very easy to tell that there are enough resources for everyone to be clothed and fed and housed and thrive. And that the boundaries between countries are really imaginary lines that we invented and that we've been fighting over for millennia brutally. And so he dedicated the rest of his life to exploring how we could shift our worldview because he saw that the way that we view the world, what we think is possible, what we believe is not possible, um, what we intend, what we pay attention to, these all actually shape our perception of reality and in many ways shape the future. And so I'm really happy to still be working with IONS. I've also now moved on for in my primary position as the executive director of the John W. Brick Mental Health Foundation, which is focused on transforming our approach to mental health and thriving to be more holistic and less mechanistic, including mind, body, and spirit and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, which was inspired by Arthur C. Clarke, who was a science fiction author, but also a futurist and an inventor. Many of the things that Arthur C. Clarke um, wrote about later came to be true or came to become inventions. And so really he was more of a futurist and our focus is on the neuroscience of imagination, uh, tools and um, technologies that can foster imagination, such as augmented reality and virtual reality, um, and um, reaching for the stars through our collaboration with the space program. And so for myself, um, I think the pandemic, even though I've done a ton of work and teach workshops on all of this, uh, after about two, three, four weeks, I felt like I was waking up out of a dream. And I had been traveling at least one or two weeks a month for many years. And I thought after sitting at home and, you know, cooking at home, gardening, being with family, being in one place, um, taking time for quite a lot of productive work, but also for reading and relaxation and not filling it with car rides and plane rides, I thought, 
you know, how could it be that four weeks ago, I thought it was sane to fly to Florida to give a 30 minute talk, you know, or to, it, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so the kinds of things we can do online, I, I think I saw on a Facebook post somewhere, you know, now we're really finding out what meetings were actually necessary. And um, so many aren't, right? And then some are, and the ability to connect with people online is tremendous. Now, after 16 weeks, I find the opposite is true in some ways that I'm beginning to understand the true value of what, what was that travel for me. It was really about gaining a new perspective by being in a different literal place on the planet every now and then. It was about um, going to places where my focus could be 100% on what I was working on as opposed to laundry dishes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I, I feel like there's some way that I need to integrate that time for in-depth focus and that ability to get a different perspective other than running around the planet like a maniac. That's great because it brings me to my first question really that you I've heard you speak about using our consciousness as we awaken and using it with intention using it intentionally in order to create change and when Sina and I were speaking about the show we, we what we wanted to, to hear from you what you mean by use our consciousness what does mm. that mean? What is consciousness and, and how do we use it? That is a, a study of a lifetime and many lifetimes probably. But um, my humble answer would be that we each have a personal layer of consciousness. So what I think, what I believe, how I view the world. And within that personal consciousness, there's an aspect of it that I'm aware of, that I know that I think or believe these things, or I know what my plans are. There's a tremendous amount of my personal consciousness that I am not actually aware of, which is a funny word for consciousness because it sounds like you're conscious, but there's a ton of personal consciousness that's non-conscious, that is automatic. It's my biases. Mm -hmm. It's my worldview. It's um, the way I think about things that I, I believe it so much that I don't even have to think about it, right? And some of those are fantastic because they allow us to do things like drive a car without having to learn to drive it every time we get back into it. So we have these um, automatic systems that allow us to function in life, but there's also a lot of um, negative automatic systems, um, implicit bias around race or gender or class, um, implicit biases about what's possible and what's not possible. So that, that layer of consciousness is something that is um, inside of myself. And then we have a collective layer of consciousness that we either share with one other person or a group of people, an organization, a neighborhood, a city, um, or all of humanity as a species that we all believe certain things are possible and impossible and we all have we all have we all jump to conclusions and have assumptions that guide our behavior and it turns out that um, many of those assumptions are not true and so my whole career has really been focused on how do we bring to light assumptions that are not true pay attention to them and then use our intention to find a new possibility Skina, bringing in Extinction Rebellion into the equation, how have you seen that play out in Extinction Rebellion? How is that, does that ring true for you in your work that you've been doing recently? Extinction Rebellion, along with other social movements, um, have a very clear intention, right? They have a very, and they pay a lot of attention to the intention. And yet, we haven't got very far because, hey, there's, a, there's an existential threat to the whole of, of life, right? Um, so I'm really interested, Cassandra, in, in I'm wondering, I'm wondering pretty much every morning <laughs> and pretty much every evening about the unconscious, actually. Limiting assumptions, those limiting beliefs um, and the pain with which they come from. The tra you know, my background is as, as a trauma uh, release, therapist, practitioner, um, healer. And I've worked for many, many years now in, in, in people's holding states of trauma. 
uh, where many of their behaviors driven by that unconscious um, fear, essentially, if we have to put it in, into one word, and then that's hard and, and it's oversimplifying, but if we put it into one word as it being fear, um, that there for Extinction Rebellion is the limiting factor, right? Uh, both in how we told our story, because we have we have um, said this is, you know, a primal emergency. You know, this is a, a primal scream almost. And um, fear states of, of people, we've actually activated a heightened fear. And yet, of course, there's a point, because of course it's true that our house is on fire. It's true right now that the Arctic, there are wildfires in the Arctic and that it's never been 45 degrees and it actually is, right? So, so this fear is rational and yet we still haven't broken through um we've created a global movement i think it's it's it, it's fair to say that we we have created a, a, the, the wildest well maybe maybe the tamest actually not the wildest the tamest non non-violent movement for non-violent civil disobedience in the world ever yes and still actually we are not in a position to say that uh, that humanity is is conscious enough is intending enough is attentive enough for us to be able to make this turning and transformation so that humanity and all species you know that that are that we are losing may survive what's in the way cassandra you know really you know tell it what's in the way yeah i mean first of all um fantastic fantastic work and just um so much kudos to you and you know i just honor the passion and the bravery and courage that you've had in your leadership of this um organization and you know, I would love to work more with Extinction Rebellion and other organizations. And um, quite a while ago, the European Environmental Agency asked me to come speak. Um, and that is an agency that has two representatives from each of the European Union. And they work on ocean health and environmental policy. They do research and then they take it back to their countries and they make recommendations. And they asked me to come speak because they said, we're making these recommendations. They're completely evidence-based. There is no question. Even the people we're taking them to don't disagree with the data, but they're not taking action. And we can't understand it. We've given them all the information we possibly can. And I just said, that's because information doesn't change people, you know? And that's maybe overly simplistic. Information is maybe... 10% of change, um, you know, so when you think about when people realized that smoking was uh, caused disease, maybe 10% of people said, oh, then I'm not going to do that anymore. But 90% of people were like, that's nice. Um, I'm getting a lot of immediate pleasure out of doing this. So I'm willing to take the risk. And I've developed a program called Campaign Science which actually takes the work that I did at the Institute of Noetic Sciences on consciousness, communication, and change. And it teaches especially people who are progressives to use what we understand scientifically about non-conscious bias and the way people are wired to make your work more effective. So one very small example would be that we use something called the rule of thirds. One of the things we do as progressives and liberals is we spend most of our time talking about the problem, informing people about the problems, raising awareness about the problems. And if people don't listen or take action, we just think we haven't been clear enough or complete enough or long enough or loud enough. So we get more loud and clear and complete and long. And we end up 
being actually the opposite of what we're trying to achieve because what the audience is hearing is exactly what you referred to threat 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 fear 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 danger 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 so if i hear that and i hear it ramping up over time i want to get away i don't want to do anything i don't want to get closer to it for sure i really just want to get away and unless you've had a profound realization and that somehow your purpose links into that realization about the danger on the planet, those are the people that are activated to take action, but that's a rare configuration. So what can we do instead? We do need to speak truth to power. We do need to draw attention to what's not working in a compelling and heartfelt and um, sometimes heartbreaking way. But that is only the beginning. And the next step is to immediately move into empowerment, invitation, grieving, in you know, really welcoming people into the conversation and saying, look, I think that there are a few solutions that we've found that they might not even be perfect, but I think we should start investing in these solutions. And this is why I think they might carry us into a different future. So you might spend 30% of your time talking about the problem, 30% of your time talking about the solution or possible solutions, not dictating it, but having a conversation about the solutions, and then a full 30% of your time talking about what is your vision for the future if these solutions were implemented. And sometimes I like to say, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. didn't get up and say, we have a problem. He got up and said, I have a dream. And even when he said we have a problem, he would say it more like, we are better than this. You know, it, we, this is not something that we can stand for any longer. Moving into the solution, focusing on the vision, because vision is what inspires long-term action. Fear inspires short-term action. So if you want to use fear as a motivator, you would have to keep ramping up the fear every day, reinforcing the fear over and over again, and making it bigger so people couldn't habituate to it. And this is exactly what the people I don't agree with about how they think about the planet do. They use that tactic to keep people in short-term threat and action mode so that they stay frozen, they stay willing to give up their rights, they stay willing to go against their values, understandably because they're very threatened and scared. So we cannot use those same tax- tactics as progressives. This, this is just incredible. Um, really, really, because this is where Extinction Rebellion is. And we, the, the thing that's going on in our movement, Cassandra, is that we keep ramping up the fear because actually that's real by the way you know the science is real the science is only getting worse um but we're holding each other if we have a collective consciousness as a movement right and what i see is that we're holding each other in this state of panic and fear and urgency um as we ramp up you know the 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 the, well the stark reality of the science um and we're lost in it you know i'll be as bold as to say i think we're lost in that fear state well it's kind of also like what's happening with coronavirus right now where you've got you know again like 30 percent of the population is like sure i'll stay home i'll wear a mask i'll do everything i can to not spread the virus And then you've got like 70% of the population who's either not doing that or really not doing, you know, opposing it. And we think as, again, as kind of liberals, that if we just continue to inform people increasingly loudly about the number of people who are dying and the number of cases that are increasing and charts and graphs, and also, frankly, telling them how idiotic they are and how stupid they are and how they don't care about life. They don't care about other people. If you imagine being invited into a new behavior and the inviter is like, you're an idiot. You should be scared. 
you're someone who obviously doesn't care about other people. Is that a movement that you want to join? No, that's not someone that you want to, to be a part of. On the other hand, one thing I love that, uh, for example, Rachel Maddow is doing is she's having live Zoom sessions with healthcare workers who are named, they have a face, they're speaking into the camera, they're telling stories about their patients all day long and what, how they feel, what they saw, what they observed. So much more powerful than all of the kind of, um, I, you know, I, I, I sound like I'm being so mean to us, you know, kind of arrogant ranting and raving that we do as liberals. Um, so I feel like that's only one of about 15 science-based or science-supported tactics that we could start infusing into our activism, whether it's climate change or health, public health, or, you know, other things. I, I have a question. I founded Divisioning Team because, because I've attended conferences where you've spoken years ago, because I know this because of my work, right? Everything you're saying, I, ha I have a an intellectual and an intuitive knowing around right and yet you know that still one still i i too often fall into the primal screen yeah and and two i certainly work in a movement that you know is is captured in its you know in its fear state and what what is it and I just want to read something to you, actually, which was will you, you read in a talk, one of your talks uh, by Willis Harmon, who was the president of the Noetics Institute. And he said, because of the interconnectedness of all minds, affirming a positive vision may be about the most sophisticated action any of us can take. Now, in a movement, that um, judges itself by its non-violent civil disobedience as the action and not really its vision or, it, or in creation, not by its visioning activity. Um, I, I'm immensely frustrated because I feel there are many, you know, there isn't a truth. I'm not saying it's true, but I feel that there is a truth in, in what we are saying here today that actually, and what Willis Harmon said, actually, possibly the most affirmative action is us speaking from a vision you know, and, and describing that, opening up people's dreams, you know, as, as Martin Luther King did, opening up people's hearts, allowing the feeling to flood their body of, of not of not of fear but of of loving heartbreak you know and and but what can i do as you know what 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 would you do if you had to sit within extinction rebellion right now and sit in a place where you could inform the strategy going forward what would you say there is a certain amount of societal immunity that is hardwired into the system, just like our bodies have homeostasis that is hardwired in. So even if every single person in your movement was the ideal and perfect tr change maker who had done all their personal work and was employing all the perfect tactics, it would still be hard. So, you know, this is not a critique necessarily of of the movement, um, but what I would do would be to say, what is not even just 21st century change making, but what is the change making of the future? How can it bring in what we know from science, what we know from the spiritual traditions, what we know from um, psychology and the experience of the people who have been through other movements, history, even what do we know from art and music? How can we bring these things in to create a brand new kind of change maker? And I do think it takes training and it takes practice. And the training and the practice have to be novel and it should be surprising. It should make you uncomfortable to think, what would it take for me to do something along the lines of linking arms and walking across the bridge in Selma? What 
is our action that is the 21st century or the future version of that. I mean, I love um, the idea of the K-pop fans, you know, using technology to overwhelm the Trump rally. You know, that's an organic movement that was amazing that came out of, you know, just youth and interconnectivity. So it's not like we can manufacture those things, but we can create the environment under which those kinds of actions are more likely to organically emerge. And so what are those environments? I can tell you now, they are not um, fear-based, they're not hatred-based, they're not um, condescending. Um, you know, I remember having a conversation with James O.D., who was the president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences at one point, and he came to us from Amnesty International, and IONS is a great organization, but I was like, wow, what brings you to IONS from Amnesty? Like, that's huge. And he said, you know, Amnesty is amazing, but at the time he came to us, he said, they're still looking for the bad people. They're still looking for the wrong people and to get rid of the bad people. And I don't think that's actually how this works. You know, we're all living out various aspects of a sick society or even a, a complete paradigmatic misunderstanding, like a deep misunderstanding about the nature of reality and what's possible. So if you were going to cultivate a garden that was meant to grow a new understanding of what's possible, what would it take? And it probably wouldn't be super sweet and kind, and it probably wouldn't be violent and, um, you know, it, it'll be a new configuration of all of those things. And I do think there's a space for protest, and I think there's a space for civil di disobedience that is, um, you know, essentially nonviolent, I, sometimes not even completely nonviolent. I think it's okay to pull down statues. I think it's okay to, you know, and the reason is that there needs to be an absolutely fierce love. So we're going to lead with love and we want to be welcoming and inviting, but it's also going to be a fierce love that we are on a train. We want every single person, no matter what your background is, to join us on this train. Um, we are going to make, we are going to arrive in a future that we create that's different. We want you to come with us. And the minute you turn your eyes towards us, you are already valued not devalued. The minute you turn your eyes toward us, you're, you are invited and valued, no matter if you've been, um, you know, Make America Great Again fan for your whole entire life, you know, you worked for the, an oil company, whatever you did, that's how we have to be. Instead of like, you all suck, we're going to take you down. And um, I think we're just going to spin our wheels. I find is um, the Extinction Rebellion that within the movement itself, the way that it's organized and the way that people act to each other, um, the way the community comes together, the creativity, the knowledge, that is incredibly inspiring. And so I feel like all those ingredients are there. I'm with you all the way. That's why I'm still <laughs> here, more than still here. I'm, you know, I think so many of us are completely dedicated to this movement because it is unique, because it is different, because it is of the future, actually. You know, we have, we have a, such a strong, um, deep-rooted commitment to regenerative culture. It's our first principle and value. And that, that is about discovering, well, it's a discovery of what that is. We don't live in regenerative culture. <laughs> So, so it's one big, vast um, co-learning, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and, and yet I, I want to be honest and say there is a block. Of course there is, because, um, you know, it, within our actions and our messaging, um, we, we've not quite made the shift into becoming a visionary movement that that trusts that that will pull people towards us.
we're really good at telling people what's wrong but actually our power rests in telling people what's wrong and telling people what we want to see happen what we want to describing what we what kind of world we want it is um a leap of faith in i think in activist consciousness you know because we are so we've been so conditioned to to to, to point at the failings because that's what's causing our anguish you know and 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 and, and heartbreak so, so pointing at it and one of the ladies and and i just want to link this into now this moment around black lives matter because Someone I've been reading the work of um, these last couple of days, a lady called Brittany Cooper, talks about eloquent rage, just as you talk about fierce love, and how much authentic truth it holds, you know. Um, and I think that's, that is the strength of Extinction Rebellion. We, we have very eloquently told the truth. And we have, you know, linked the heart we have been able to open heartbreak up you know um, and grief we have opened a gateway for grief what we haven't i don't think what we haven't we haven't done yet is made that leap of faith into vision and and, and i'm so delighted that we're talking about that now and that we're able to give give some science to it and i suppose actually cassandra i for 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 those in extinction rebellion that feel very safe within the science, you know, um, and, and look to the science first uh, as a way of, of experiencing the world or, or deciding a viewpoint. What is it that we can say through the science? Well, that's why I called the organization I started Campaign Science, because um, there is quite a lot of cognitive science, neuroscience, social science, that speaks directly to, let's say, for example, messaging. And so we know that when we frame our messages uh, primarily about what we don't want, that the brain doesn't process no very well, actually. So if you uh, say, um, no pollution, no pollution, no pollution, no pollution, no pollution, no pollution. The message that's coming to the brain is pollution, 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 and no, 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 no. And so it's imagining polluted skies and all these things, and it's a no means stop, get away. And so the frontal cortex or the thinking brain has to overcome that initial get me away from this to get there. Now, why do we want to create a barrier that people have to be conscious enough to overcome to get there? Why wouldn't we say clear skies, clear skies, clear skies? And, you know, you could use so many different uh, examples of that. And I've been so um, amazed, you know, when I get emails um, and God love her, I, I adore her, but you know, a lot of them are like Nancy Pelosi and it'll say from Nancy Pelosi, disgusting crime. And she's trying to speak the truth about something she sees in a corrupt politician. And I just, I've written to her like five times. When you say Nancy Pelosi, disgusting crime, it may get you more clicks, which is what you're looking for it's going to get you less long-term action and actually empowered action on the part of people. They'll open it, they'll read it, they'll, they'll be disgusted and then they'll move on with their life. And disgust is not what we're trying to elicit in people. When people feel disgust, they go into a corollary of fight, flight, or freeze. And for people who have no power to fight, it'll be flight or freeze. So those kinds of scientific concepts, I think, are what could really inform a novel, innovative, new change making that is not naive. It's not Pollyanna. It's not like, oh, we're just going to run around throwing daisies at people. I mean, it's not that at all. There's a warrior stance we will no longer stand for this. We are better than this. 
we have a potential solution that we want to invest in. We want to ask you to invest in it. And I want you to link arms with me as we create a future that looks like this. It looks like this. It looks like this. It looks like this. It looks like clean, healthy oceans. It looks like clean, healthy rivers. It looks like uh, parks that your children can play in. This is what it looks like. And between those three things, I think it can be very powerful. George Lakoff is another person I recommend people read his stuff um, because he's a linguist who's looked very closely into how does language cause people to react. Um, we know, for example, that people who receive threat primes in a laboratory, um, even if it's subconscious, so they'll use flash an image that the person doesn't even know they saw, and then they give them a questionnaire asking them if they are more or less likely to endorse a violent solution to conflict, or they're more or less likely to give up their, their rights in exchange for safety, if you flash the threat prime, they will be more likely to give up their rights and more likely to endorse a violent solution. So we know that putting people in threat states is not an answer to bra uh, eliciting bravery, eliciting courage, eliciting vulnerability. And so those are just some examples. There's one more that's on a more positive note, which is the power of storytelling. And, you know, if we can just start to add more powerful, genuine, authentic stories to every one of our um, encounters, every one of our speeches, every one of our PowerPoints, and we tell a story about a real human or a real family or a real case study of a city that did do something different and this is how it ended up, um, people's brains when you're telling a story you can see in their brain scans that they're actually tracking the same that you're tracking and that's the function of storytelling in evolutionarily in humanity is to be able to experience something that you're not going to maybe be able to experience yourself and so you're actually entraining the brain of your audience when you tell a story about a positive future and so you're also entraining them when you tell a story about uh, the all of the other stuff and so just the power of storytelling would be and, and like I said there's you know about 15 or 20 of these kinds of science-based tactics techniques um, they do require some personal work because the last thing I'll say is you can't pull it off inauthentically all of us have seen politicians who are like the other day, I talked to Joe in the factory line, and he told me about how he didn't have insurance. Everyone's like, no, you didn't. There's no Joe. Like, ugh, don't lie. It has to come from genuine, actual, vulnerable, heartfelt storytelling, emotional storytelling that's real, that's not dishonest. If we go back back to the beginning, as it were, and we talk about uh, consciousness once again, having talked about everything we've discussed, every, there's, everything is in flux at the moment, and, and we're all coming out of something huge that has altered us and has um, altered our consciousness. Are we at some sort of tipping point? Would you say that this is the perfect moment for that change that we're, we're speaking about here to happen? And in terms of Black Lives Matter, I think it's amazing. I think it's incredible what's happened. I, no one could have ever imagined that tens of thousands of white people would be marching the streets saying Black Lives Matter, that, you know, I mean, politicians, companies making, you know, giant companies making their logos black. It's just incredible. It's a huge breakthrough and it's going to require sustained action and sustained um, on the part primarily of white people to sustain that momentum to change the implicit racism, the institutionalized racism, the systematic racism and brutality. And so, you know, I'm working on a project right now on um, shifting bringing training to shift police departments. Um, so I think it's that's really the long game is, is what we've got to do. Around climate change, There's it just feels to me like there has been sort of a, um, a staticness um, to the movement. And 
maybe it's what you said earlier, Skeena, that it's so huge. It's just so primally threatening um, that it's hard for people to wrap their minds around. And so one of the things we do in our workshops is we work with people to connect something that they care about very deeply to a larger collective societal kind of even spiritual purpose and then to what action they feel empowered to be able to take however small and if we can help put people into that alignment I, it's almost like a loop you know like you've got the deep purpose you've got your own personal affi affinity for whatever reason I want to work on the salmon you know I the salmon run I want to work on the trees you may have a childhood memory who knows why and then you link it to a realistic achievable action and give them a ton of support around that and actually you know have them engage in some of those actions however large or small for some people it's going to be starting a multinational NGO and raising a hundred million dollars for other people it's going to be changing the plastic silverware at their child's school into reusable it doesn't really matter if you can have them do the action and feel the reward from it and then continue to do that I think that's that's really where it lies. So if we if we do want to move forward on the Black Lives Matter movement or the climate change movement, how do we make everybody a futurist? And how do we make everybody uh, someone who doesn't feel so threatened that they're paralyzed? And, you know, you can have that eloquent rage and that is moving in and of itself. And for some people that is their only, that is their job. That is their job to speak that eloquent rage over and over again. But for vast portions of the population, they have to move through that into action, into constructive action. So, so here's the thing. Um, I, whether it's climate change or um, institutional, racism um and white supremacy um they are for me they are the same crisis it's the, it's the the separation story that that deep in our gut right um and i have this hunch now that actually what what if the future story what if if becoming the futurist was about us um, really noticing each other in, in, in our chosen purpose and holding out our hand and saying I know your purpose is actually mine because it stems from the same separation you know um, it, it's it's violence you know it, it's just um, yeah it's just it's just um, well it's for me, it's 5,000 years of patriarchy, right? Um, and, and a way that we've, we've told our stories through that about our individualism, our, our independence, our separation, and the lines with which we, we must be separate from each other. The, th the thing is, um, I think what COVID has, has shown us and also what the Black Lives Matter moment has shown us is how abandoned people feel actually you know again it's a separation story it's that it's it's our feeling of abandonment right um and very literally being abandoned um and so i have a hunch cassandra that it's it's about us actually coming out from behind you know the the, the curtain that we've chosen to peer out from um, and saying, actually, your your pain is my pain. Your the violence that, that has been done unto you is is actually the same violence that has stemmed from the same violence that's been done unto me. And it's I think Martin Luther King described it, didn't he? Um, that actually um, all injustices there is no 
There is no dealing with one injustice without dealing with the other. And something I'm working on, Cassandra, is, is something called the Co-Liberation Project to really know that your salvation, your emancipation, and your thriving depends on mine and mine on yours. So, so I need to get on the street. Well, of course I do, because, you know, as, as a brown body of culture, I am, you know, that, you know, but, but, I, but there are multiple reasons why I or any of us need to get on the street. And my question is then, how do we make these, th this deep collaboration happen between injustices? The first thing that comes to my mind, and I'm, I'm not super educated about this, so I would love to learn more and talk more about it, um, is again, like there is a place for trauma bonding. There is a place for connecting around our pain, connecting around our, our similar or shared trauma. But until that moves into building something together, it hasn't really transformed. And so, you know, I wonder if there's some day that as we march and as we tear down institutions, that there's just as much creation. You know, I love the Black Lives Matter on the street leading to the White House. You know, I love the, it, it's not like the other things have to stop. It's that most of this is an additive model. So can we add to it that at the end of the march, everyone works together to build a gigantic model of the White House, but to paint it rainbow? Like, could we add more building and creating and um, especially things that are uh, somewhat challenging and that require people to work together to make them happen, that you'd have to climb on someone's shoulders to make the next thing happen and they would have to hold up to other people to, you know, so I wonder if we can add more building, more creating, more of those memes, because that's what we really want to ripple out into the world. And also, I would just also say like, we have got to start having more um, fun. We've got to start having more joy. And I don't mean, you know, superficial. I mean, we need to start having more sacred, passionate joy. That's why the gospel songs were there, is that there is a something that cannot be taken away from us. And in that mode of reaching out our hands and inviting other people, even people we consider the other side, we've got to look at, are we anything that anybody would want to join that disagreed with us? You know, if it's not like, this is cool, this is fun. You know, if it were up to me for mask wearing, I would have, you know, 70 football stars get up with their masks. You, you got to make it cool. You have to make it interesting. You have to make it em something that people want to look up to, that they want to emulate. All of us kind of running around, pulling out our hair, saying we're all going to die if we don't do something about this is not anything that anybody else wants to join. <laughs> you know, they're like, knock yourself out, but no thanks. So how do we make it? And you know, I don't know much about Extinction Rebellion, but everything I've seen, you have done a great job at making people want to join it. The colors are beautiful. The wording is beautiful. There's a lot of celebration and joy in it. And I would say just keep doing that at least as much as the other. You know how Code Pink ran around, you know, throwing pies in people's faces and things like that, right? It's, I'm not sure that's my jam, but I did like how visible they were and they showed up everywhere. And like, can we have those kinds of teams that show up everywhere that are doing something maybe different than that? But, you know. It's a long process though, isn't it? We're talking about, uh, maybe, how long would you say? I mean, do you, are you saying, uh, it's because it feels like things are shifting so fast at the moment, every day brings something different. I think it's like, in science, we look at um, Kuhn's uh, structure of scientific revolution and this is a person who looked at all the previous scientific revolutions, like when did we learn about germ theory and when did we learn about electricity and when did everybody finally go like, oh my God, that's true. And so there are these stages where first there's a small group of people who are saying there's a problem here and everybody else says they're crazy. Then there's a little bit bigger group of people who start to get evidence for their thing and then they really get suppressed. Then they start forming societies and 
uh, sort of external secret societies and then public societies. And then there's a crisis moment where either the dominant paradigm shuts them down through ridicule and through all kinds of tactics and we go on as usual, or that group finally breaks through, through evidence, through storytelling, through actual, you know, observation. There was a great story of the woman who learned that x-rays caused um, cancer, and this is why we now wear lead every time we have x-rays, but at the time, people were doing x-rays all over the place. They were doing them in shoe stores. They were like a fun thing for kids to go, like, see their skeletons behind the x-ray, and um, this woman collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data points and finally said, I think it's the x-rays. And they were like, you're insane. And plus you're a woman, you know, and you're a nurse, not a doctor. And, you know, you just watch that process where finally they're like, oh my God, she's right. <laughs> we have to do something. So that's the magic moment. And what makes that moment happen? I wish I knew, you know, but I think it's a combination of everything we've been talking about. Oh, we let you go, Cassandra. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to us about your work with interconnectivity, interconnectedness with it, uh, between everyone. Because I feel like that is quite literally the glue that brings all this together, right? If I do something, it's going to impact you and it's going to have a ripple effect. As I mentioned about Edgar's experience of oneness and interconnectedness, he, once he realized that, he knew it and he couldn't unsee it. He couldn't unknow it. And in general my experience over these years has been the only way to truly understand interconnectedness is to experience it. And it's not verbal. It's not uh, something you can teach. It's not something you can tell someone. You can tell people about interdependence. You know, you can show how your actions affect people on the other side of the world who are making your clothes and all that stuff. But the other the, the really difficult thing is to help people have personal experiences of interconnectedness in ways that once they see it, they cannot not see it anymore. And once you see it that way, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, for you to engage in behaviors that harm others while benefiting yourself. It becomes very difficult for you to say those are the bad people you know, the, those people deserve what they get because you know there aren't any other people, other bad people, you know, there aren't bad people and good people, there are just people. And so how, that's a really tricky one, is how can we induce these experiences of oneness and interconnectedness? And it's one thing that I'm working on now with um, virtual reality is to try to induce self-transcendent experiences um, I'm also working with the psychedelic research group at UC San Diego because it seems like um, psychedelics under certain contexts are fairly reliable inducers of experiences of oneness and interconnectedness. Um, but how are we going to get that to the masses? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, you know, we may have to Trojan horse it. You know, how do we get that kind of experience out to the masses of a, a true experience of interconnectedness. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, mainstreaming psych some, you know, thoughtful use of psychedelics, mainstreaming use of virtual reality. In fact, I'm just finishing a VR experience of Edgar's experience in space that we hope to get out to adults and kids in classrooms around the world so they can have uh, that feeling narrated by him, which is going to be really cool when people come onto the streets to be in in nonviolent civil disobedience it's a, it's a transcendent experience that is true i love that i love that and i hadn't really thought about that you know that these connection. marches it really is your one body you you feel you feel oneness you feel um a connection that is hard to describe, that is only an experience. Um, that it is, it is a, it feels like an initiation. Actually, uh, I have heard. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from rebels. It has changed my life. Being on the in rebellion has changed my life and my perception of life. 
and the reality of it. And, and so maybe we need to make more of that and say to people, look, you know, you coming, it's, it's not just about the no and, and uh, it's about having this incredible experience that, um, you know, of, of thriving, you know, yeah. The last thing I could say about training for change makers is that when you are in the presence of a change maker who has fully had that realization and they've dealt with their own shadow material and they've done this work on conscious change making, and some people are just naturally good at this, you feel a transmission from that person. It's not about what they're saying. You're, you get goosebumps, you get tears in your eyes, your heart starts to pound. They could be saying the same thing that another change maker is saying, but you are being brought into an experience of connectedness and you hear that ring of truth in your body and that's a bell that cannot be unrung. So in terms of training change makers, my dream would be that we train them in all of these tactics. We do ask them to do the shadow work, but we also train them in being this sort of transparent um, stained glass window through which a much bigger force is coming through so that the people who are listening, it's hard for them to say anymore that I can't hear this. They, they can't stop listening. They can't look away. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. To wrap everything up, I, can I ask both of you to just Think ahead 50 years. What would be your hope? How would you like to see the world in 50 years? We already have the ability without any new innovation of technology to feed and clothe and house everyone in the world. I can see a world where there are clean rivers, clean skies, clean oceans, clean land, where the um, species are being reinstated um, as opposed to extinction, more extinction, and where there is a, you know, tapestry of all color people working together for beauty and change and he healing the pain, you know. Um, one of the other things that I always use as kind of one example is there's so many things that need to be dealt with, but prisons in, in particular always strike me as that will be for me a big moment when we all decide that we can't put people in cages who are mentally ill, traumatized, in poverty, you know, that the, the putting people in cages is not a, no longer an acceptable solution. So I would love to see that in my lifetime because I think that will either be a symbol or a pivot point where there's a new, um, and, and that we, we may not stop eating animals, but I hope we stop torturing animals. So, yeah. Thank you. Skeena, what about in terms of Extinction Rebellion? Where would you like to see, what would you like it to be like in 50 years? <laughs> well, actually, you know, just in a few years, I think that, um, I think we will become the adaptation story. I think um, we will be able to be the ones who create the systems rather than saying we want to change the system or we want the people in the system to change. I think what we'll be doing is creating those new systems. It will be a local affair. It will be for communities who re reclaim their land to watch their water cycles, to start watching the clouds again, um, and, and to know what their water cycle needs to repair itself, to know what grows in their woods, in, you know, in their landscapes, and to be able to um, harvest and you know, bring fertility to, to to their to their land and their and and actually I think I, I yes there's all this vision that that I have for extinction rebellion moving into that phase of work you know and really the, and people coming together 
in, in all kinds of ways, whether it's politically um, or socially to do it. But I also have more than anything, I have this vision for love meaning something new. I don't know what it is yet. Um, I don't think humans yet have experienced the kind of love that um, oneness asks us to experience. And I think we're getting there. We're, we're becoming ready for that, actually. Uh, the, I see the polarization and challenges like COVID preparing us, right? Preparing us for really knowing that that's the kind of love that, that we need and that we're here to become. I think that when, when that happens, um, everything fall, will fall into its own destined, purposeful place. And so I think this is about us healing relationship and our own relationship with love. Um, and, and that's what, what I'm dreaming of. I, I would agree in this time of COVID, what I've really seen is people tap into real abundance, you know, whatever it is that people have. I, I hardly hear anyone complain. I hear people say, I'm grateful for my pet. I'm grateful for my balcony. I'm grateful for the park. I'm grateful for the shopkeeper down the road, the cat that comes in, whatever. Somebody has always said, I am grateful for something. And I really have seen that come up in people. It's like in this time, we've tapped into that universal flow of abundance. So we have everything available to us. And I really, that's made me really, really hopeful, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Yeah, beautiful. So good. I, I can tell all of us could spend a crazy girls weekend together. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. 